Hello, dear students, and welcome back to our discussion on modern Indian history. We have understood how the Britishers were able to successfully establish their rule in India. In due course of this process, they brought about several policies, created many pillars which would transform and disrupt the lives of Indians like never before. The pain that Indians experienced because of the disruptions brought about by the Britishers naturally led to a response by Indians against the British rule. This response we have seen was of two types. One was the traditional response and second one was modern response. The traditional response which was based on traditional methods relied on violence was led by semi-feudal type of leaders, so on and so forth. This traditional response could be seen in three different patterns. The first pattern was the uprising of civil population. Second was peasant unrest. These two we have already seen in our immediately preceding lectures. Today we are going to understand the tribal revolts that will take place during British rule. The tribals who had traditionally lived peacefully in their forested areas, they will suddenly rise up against the Britishers and lead many violent and militant movements against the British rule and its various supporters. This begs the question as to why the tribals were rebelling against the British. What is it that was agitating them? The tribals, dear students, had traditionally lived peacefully and in complete harmony with nature. The kind of societal structures, various practices and beliefs that they had evolved were actually in tune with their life in the forested areas. But when the British rule comes about, this social structure, cultural practices and beliefs that they were having all of those will get disrupted because of the changes that Britishers will introduce. Their traditional way of life will now be very terribly affected. The Britishers who had no clue or no idea about you know, the kind of life and systems and practices that tribals had, they will bring about changes keeping in mind the plain areas of Bengal and then rest of the country. The systems of these areas will be extended exactly the same way to the tribal areas also. Now this will naturally lead to big disruptions for the tribals and they will be left with no other option but to rise up en masse against the British rule and all the visible support system of it. The Britishers developed new land revenue systems and policies which completely militated against the tribal way of life. The permanent settlement in Bengal, for instance, declared the zamindar as the land owner. Furthermore, land was made as a absolute ownership based property. Land could be easily bought and sold between any two consenting parties. Now all of this was something very alien for the tribal population. Traditionally, in the tribal societies, there were systems like the Khund Kati system, wherein the tribals through common lineage collectively owned the land. There was no idea or concept of absolute ownership. Furthermore, the tribal societies lived an isolated kind of life with fairly limited interaction with the outsiders. But this reform or changes that the Britishers will implement will lead to influx of many new sections in the tribal society naturally leading to conflicts between them. So tribals were in a way compelled to take up arms against the state which had brought about so far reaching changes. The zamidars, the thekedars, the money lenders, dikus as some of these tribals will call them, these outsiders or dikus will be rapacious and exploitative of the tribals. They will force the tribals to pay high rents. They will compel them 
to borrow money from the money lenders. The money lenders will take advantage of their lack of knowledge and cheat them in terms of repayment of the loans. All of these characters will very often force the tribals to do free labor or wait begari for them. Now, all of this was militating against the dignity of these tribals who had proudly lived their way of life in the forested areas. Naturally, these tribals will understand that somewhere the changes are being brought about by the British government. It was the British government's changes that introduced the zamidars, thekedars and moneylenders into the rural areas. Therefore, they will try to even appeal to the British government to look into their you know, problems, to their grievances. But the British government saw these people, the zamidars, the thekedars, the moneylenders as actually agents of the colonial state. These people were facilitating the increasing exploitation by the communal state. And consequently, the British state will be heedless about the exploitation that it, these sections are doing of the tribals. Left with no alternative, we will see that many tribal groups will stand up, rise up against the Britishers. You know, despite the unequal odds, they will bravely fight against them and leave behind a legacy of resistance against the colonial rule. In our discussion today, we will be going into some of the important case studies from the tribal revolts and understand what exactly was happening over there. This is an area on which UPSC has asked questions in prelims. A question in mains was also asked in context of revolt of 1857 and the previous uprisings. So this is an area which is relatively important guys. Now let us go in and see some of the individual case studies. But before that, a few characteristics of tribal revolts must be kept in mind. The first in that is identity. The tribal revolts, wherever they took place, we will see a remarkable level of tribal solidarity in these revolts. So when the tribes are rising up, whether it will be the Santhals, Mundas or Bhils, you will see largely the community will back the call and they will extend full support in these tribal revolts. This is very, uh, you know, this is very special about the tribal society where there is a high level of solidarity amongst the members. So any challenge on the community is seen as a challenge for one and all. And therefore, we'll see that tribals in quite large numbers will fight against the British. If you take the case of Santhal Hul, there would be more than 60,000 Santhals who will commit themselves into this fight, men and women included. It is said that as many as 15,000 Santhals were killed by the Britishers during this revolt of Santhals. So that shows the kind of solidarity that was there based on common tribal identity. This is a crucial point of these revolts. Second after that is Historians see a class angle also in these struggles. Now, yes, while primarily they are rebelling as a tribe based on that tribal identity, but a deeper economic analysis also reveals that there was class distinction between the exploiters and the exploited. The exploited were largely like landless peasants who were being cheated by the more uh, you know, powerful economic class which included merchants, traders and money lenders. So in that sense, this was a class struggle between the haves and the have-nots of those times. So we cannot overlook the role of class-based conflict also in this. Thirdly, traditional societies that they were, tribals for the sake of mobilization will often use, uh, you know, divine figures for motivating the tribes to fight against the British imperialism. Very often in these tribal fights, we will see that Messiah-like leaders will be promised. The leaders of the revolts will say that they've had a direct communication with, uh, you know, God or some other supernatural belief that they had and victory was on their side. Now, considering the nature of the society, the times when these revolts take place, uh, these things are very understandable. 
any force which is fighting a much more superior opponent re relies on higher level of morale and motivation and consequently for that society these kind of motivations were necessary use of traditional weapons while taking on a modern colonial state the tribals who were obviously not trained and did not have any access to modern weapons will rely on the weapons that they have been traditionally using and yes they will use it to a great effect for in, during the course of many of these revolts we will see that british rule for a brief period at least you know was completely swept away in particular areas all this using traditional weapons only but then there's only a limit to which this kind of warfare could lead the tribals ultimately the more superior modern forces especially sent from calcutta in the case of major revolts will ultimately suppress them thus these revolts will turn out to be largely violent localized but very intense one these will be fought with great vigor with a lot of commitment courage and sacrifice will be able to give the british you know a taste of their own medicine but ultimately all of these will be suppressed the british will ultimately be able to overcome all of them sometimes in a matter of weeks sometimes in a matter of months but in the immediate outcome most of these revolts will not be able to achieve the desired result yes that does not in any way undermine their importance they have a larger role to play to establish a tradition of resistance number 1 and number two some of these revolts if not all did convince the britishers to have some kind of modification in their approach and policy as we will see now in the details let us now start with the first revolt in this context which is chuar or jangal mahal uprising chuar or jangal mahal uprising now this jangal mahal back then was a sort of a district that the britishers had created which included these areas of Mednapur and Bankura. This is bordering with Jharkhand. So back then they have the Diwani rights of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. You remember that? So consequently in this area they had created the Jangal Mahal district which as the name suggests uh, had a lot of forested areas and it is here that one of these very first tribal revolt will take place which is called as Jangal Mahal Uprising. Jungle Mahal Uprising. Okay. It's also called as Chuar Uprising, but as textbooks tell us that this was used as a slang against the tribals to humiliate and demean them. Therefore, it is fitting that we try to address it more as Jangal Mahal Uprising. Background. The Chuar tribes were farmers, hunters, and pegs. Remember this for forest zamidars. Traditionally, these tribals who were living over here, they had multiple, you know, means of sustaining themselves. They used to farm, they used to do hunting, and also they used to serve as pegs. Okay, who are pegs? Pegs are foot soldiers or guards. Foot soldiers or guards. That is why they are called as pegs. We have seen the Paika rebellion in Odisha. They are also those Paika rebels were basically soldiers who were serving under the Raja of Kharda. Same thing is applicable over here. These were Paiks for forest zamidars. These tribes, they will rebel due to famine-like condition that will, you know, start in Bengal after the British take over. The revenue system that the Britishers brought about led to a lot of economic distress and challenges. And consequently, we'll see that this area will be a bit restive and there will be multiple stages in which the tribals will rise against the British state. Region is Jangal Mahal area of Midnapur district and Bankura district of Bengal as we have seen on the map. Causes, as we have seen, number one, famine. After that, increase land revenue demands. As soon as Warren Hastings takes over, in 1772, he is given the first target of stabilizing the revenue condition of East India Company. And for that reason, Warren Hastings will try to increase the burden of revenue on the Indian Zamindars. Naturally, this will have an impact on the 
farmers, the peasants also. Furthermore, later the permanent settlement will be implemented by Lord Cornwallis. And with this permanent settlement, as we have discussed earlier as well, land will become a saleable commodity. Zamidar is the absolute owner of the land and that land is a saleable commodity. This will naturally lead to a lot of transfer of land. When Zamidars were not able to pay the revenue to the state, their Zamidari right was finished and it was then auctioned to others. Now people from distant cities, they will invest in the auctions of the Zamidaris. This will lead to entry of new type of Zamidars in these areas. All of this brought untold misery and economic distress for these tribes. And consequently, we'll see that many of them will join this rebellion. It was not only Chuars, but also many other tribes around that area who would also participate in this revolt. Now, some names that we must know over here. Number one in that is Jagannath Singh, the Zamindar of Ghatshila. Jagannath Singh, during his times, actually this revolt will start and later it will be continued by his uh, family, by his sons. Later, Durjan Singh, this is the most important name. Durjan Singh in 1798-99, the Zamindar of Raipur area. Now, this should not be confused with Raipur of Chhattisgarh, that Raipur was in this area only. So, he will lead a very powerful revolt against the British rule and it is said that he established his control or his rule over as many as 30 villages. Some other name, Madhab Singh, Raja Mohan Singh and Lachman Singh. These are the names that we must have at the back of our mind. But the most important one is Durjan Singh and Jagannath Singh. These couple of names we must know. The British East India Company sent a huge army and suppressed these revolts in a very violent manner. Typical of British rule in those times. And this revolt will come to an end. So this is the first one that we must know. Now we will go ahead but before that a very quick but very important announcement for all of you. Our super learning days, super learning days are ending today guys, 30th of September. If you have not yet availed the special discount that is there on Study IQ IAS's batches, all the batches that are open for admission right now. Today is the last day for it, guys. If you haven't yet enrolled for these batches, then this is your opportunity to actually do it. You will get a handsome discount on our regular P2I September batch, evening batch, which is running right now. And you'll be paying only 27,000 rupees instead of 60,000 by using my code JDLIFE. I have been telling you this, guys, and I can't stress it, uh, you know, any less. This batch, the P2I batch, is the one-stop solution for all your preparation needs in civil services examination. Make the most of this opportunity. If you get the right guidance at the right time, then only you have a good chance of cracking this examination. Don't indulge in trial and error. Don't do that. Even if you have taken an attempt or two earlier without proper preparation, then this is the right time for you to give your preparation the proper direction that it requires. This exam is not at all difficult in terms of its content. The challenge is the spread that the exam has. It requires a very methodical approach for preparation. A lot of students end up doing trials and errors in their preparation journey and waste their precious energy in that process. Don't let that be your case. Enroll for the P2I batch available in English, Hindi as well as English mediums for your convenience. So with that done, now let us see the next case study uh, regarding the tribal revolts in India. The next case study is that of the coals of Chota Nagpur region. Now, this is the Chota Nagpur region guys, that is modern day Jharkhand area bordering West Bengal. This area is known to be the habitat for many different tribes of India. Background of this is that Coles, the tribals who are living over here, there are many tribes, many tribes living over here, Coles one of them. They revolted against large scale transfer of their land 
to outsiders, especially money lenders. And also the heavy tax burden that the colonial state was imposing on them. We have understood how the policies of Britishers had led to introduction of money lenders, thekedars and new zamidars in tribal areas. Now these elements are seen with great disgust by the tribals for having altered their traditional way of life. These money lenders, thekedars, zamidars, they were extremely oppressive towards the tribal people. And consequently, we'll see that there will be a lot of seething anger against these sections. The transfer of land that was taking place, tribals now lost access to land and they became just owners of the plow. They had to serve these sections of the society. Heavy tax burden, money lender exploitation and overall British policies. This led to the coal uprising in 1831. We must know the number, name of Budho Bhagat, the leader of this revolt. Apart from that, Madara Mahato is also a significant name. But if question is asked, most likely it will be on Budho Bhagat. Result, Coles and other tribes with them, they rebelled. Large scale military operations had to be launched to suppress. But then ultimately, as with all the tribal revolts and earlier traditional responses, these will be suppressed by the British using superior force. This is the coal uprising of Chota Nagpur area. After this comes Santhal Hul, the Santhal Rebellion or Santhal Hul in 1855-56. Santhal Hul, which UPSC has once asked in the prelims in recent years. Let us understand the background of Santhals. Santhals, Santhals are Tribals who were living in a particular area called as Damane Ko, the area of Damane Ko. These Santhals will rebel against British East India Company again because of the same reasons, the policies that Britishers were introducing. The Zamidari system that British brought under permanent settlement, it led to increased taxes, forced labor, confiscation, transfer of land. The grudges, the grievances will largely remain the same. Santals lived in the area between Bhagalpur and Rajmahal Hills. Rajmahal Hills are basically on the bordering area of Jharkhand and West Bengal. Damane Ko, this Ko means mountain in Persian. It's the same as Ko -e Noor, the diamond. Ko -e Noor, mountain of light. Ko -e Noor, the name that Nadir Shah had given Babar's diamond. Damane Ko, since it is a mountainous area where the Santhals were living peacefully, earlier dislocated from other areas, they had been brought here and settled here and they had hoped that they will be able to practice their traditional lifestyle without any interference. But that was not the case. The effect of British policies that was visible on this area also now. Introduction of permanent settlement led to introduction of foreigners as well. Now foreigners, by foreigners we don't mean Europeans. Here foreigners means foreigners to the tribals, whom they called as Dikus. This term is important. Remember this term, Diku. High taxes, forced labor, confiscation, new currency introduced. All of this led to a lot of discontent in the Santhals. Otherwise known to be peaceful, these Santhals even tried to appeal to the British government to look into their grievances. But the British government was least bothered because these elements, the moneylenders, the thekedars, the zamidars, those were actually agents of the colonial state. What these people were doing was exploitation on behalf of the colonial state basically. So there was no motivation for the British company at this point, for the British rule at this point to actually interfere and stop this exploitation. Naturally, there was a point to which these, you know, proud tribals would bear this exploitation. Sidhu and Kanhu, two brothers, Sidhu and Kanhu Murmu, these two brothers will take up the fight against the Britishers. They claimed inspiration from the divine and promised the tribals that we 
will have deliverance from this exploitation. That is, this exploitative regime is going to end. We are going to establish our own Raj over here, but we have to come out and fight against the British rule and its various agents. Many of their family members also, including two of their brothers and two sisters, they also directly participated in this fight and were leaders in their own right. They gave the vision of a Santhal Raj. Santhal Raj, where once again, like in the good old golden days, they will live a life in harmony with nature, in con uh, you know, coherent with their traditional beliefs and practices. The Santhal Hul was a very fierce rebellion. Very fierce rebellion. Several thousand Santhals laid down their lives. 60,000 participated and about 15,000, 15, it is said, uh, you know, were martyred in the course of this revolt. Women under the leadership of the sisters of Sidhu and Kanhu, they also participated in, in substantial numbers. For a brief while, they were able to sweep away the British rule and even established a parallel sort of an administration in the place of British system. The British understood the severity of this threat and responded back with, you know, typical ferocity of the colonial state. Martial law was imposed, army was brought in. These revolters, they were suppressed without any mercy. Thousands and thousands of these people were killed, their villages destroyed, their houses were burned. You know, elephants were used to trample upon the mud thatched houses that many of these tribals possessed. Ultimately, after this revolt is suppressed, the Britishers realized that there must be some kind of a conciliation with the tribals, otherwise there can be future such occurrences. So after a detailed study, they brought about special laws for this area, which was now segregated and called as the Santhal Pargana. Santhal Pargana, part of Jharkhand, northeastern part of Jharkhand, Santhal Pargana. Special laws were brought for, for it, including Santhal Pargana Tenancy Act. Santhal Pargana Tenancy Act 1876, which said that land could not be transferred. Land could not be transferred to the non-tribals from tribals. So this was, although land is still a commodity, but then transfer from non-tribal to tribal is not allowed. Since non-tribals had exploited and fraudulently taken away their lands. Before this, Sidhu and Kanhu in the revolt had been captured one after another and both of them had been hanged. But their legacy lives on, their contribution will never be forgotten. So this is the Santhal Rebellion or Santhal Hoon. Now let us see a question that UPSC had asked in 2018. After the Santhal uprising subsided, what was or were the measures taken by the colonial government? Two statements. The territories called Santhal Parganas were created. It became illegal for a Santhal to transfer land to a non-Santhal. So as we have seen in the points, both these statements are actually correct. Pargana was also created and law was also brought about to prevent this type of transfer. Okay. Now guys, having seen the some of the tribal revolts and uprisings, we will go ahead and see some of the other major ones, but just let me caution you that broadly the grievances will remain the same. So that's why a few of the points will appear to be repetitive and hence we will touch upon them very briefly. What will change is of course the region, the leadership and the tribe involved. But broadly speaking, the context will be the same British policies and the changes that are being brought about consequent to them. And secondly, will perhaps be in the form of outcome. Sometimes the results will be different, but largely the context will be very similar. Now let us talk about the Khond revolts. The Khond tribe revolted against the Britishers because of suppression of the traditional way of life of these Khonds in which uh, they even had practice of human sacrifice. You remember when we had studied William Bentinck? I told you that Bentinck had taken very aggressive measures to stop uh, such uh, inhuman sacrifices. And also the same British policies which will lead to entry of outsiders in these tribal areas. 
Other tribes apart from Khonds will also participate in this revolt, including Gumsar and Kalahandi. Okay. The region where this happens is in Odisha and parts of Vishakapatnam district in Andhra Pradesh also. So, Shrikakulam and Vishakapatnam in these areas, these revolts will happen. 1837 to 56. Cause is influx of outsiders, change of traditional way of life and prohibition of uh, practices that the tribes earlier had. Remember the name of the leader, Chakra Bisoi. Chakra Bisoi or Raja Chakra Bisoi as he was called, he will be the leader of this revolt and as long as he is there to lead, the revolt will continue. The British will suppress but ultimately Chakra Bisoi will vanish and after that the movement will lose the leadership and consequently it will peter out. So this is the Khond uprising in some parts of Odisha and Vishakhapatnam. After this comes the revolt of the Bheels. Thus far, the tribal revolts that we have seen, those were there in Bengal, in Jharkhand area and now in Odisha also. After this, certain revolts, tribal revolts will take place in western part of India also. Prominent one in that is Bheel revolt, 1818 to 31 and then again later in 20th century in 1913. Context of the Bheel Revolt is the ever-expanding British rule which had defeated the Marathas in the Anglo-Maratha Wars. Remember the Third War ends in 1817. The Bheels had served in the army of different Maratha chiefs. Now they don't have that traditional uh, you know, career alternative. But the Britishers who have taken over this area have introduced new types of land revenue systems here also and these land revenue systems will lead to introduction of many new colonial agents like the money lenders all of this will lead to conflict between the bheels and the british state region of this was western ghats and south rajasthan although the bheels are there in many other areas but then prominently the revolt is here only reason were obvious as we saw british expansion administrative changes that they brought about and exploitation by money lenders. Govind the Guru. Govind the Guru is the revered leader of this, of this particular revolt. Of this particular revolt. Govind Guru, this name is very important. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, he, uh, even the Prime Minister had offered his obeisance in one event to the leader Govind Guru. Result, British used force and conciliatory efforts and ultimately brought down or suppressed this revolt. Very typical about all these revolts in 19th century. Ultimately, superior force, firepower will be able to overcome these traditional Indian revolts. After this comes the revolt of the Ramoshis. The Ramoshis were a tribe in the western Ghat who had now lost their livelihood after Man Maratha areas were annexed by the British. The Ramoshis are hill tribe, very brave uh, and they were often employed in the state employment under the Marathas but then after the Marathas are defeated, now the Ramoshis do not have that traditional role to play. Therefore, there was this resentment of the Ramoshis against the British. Leaders, the names that we must remember, Chittur Singh and later Umaji Naik of Pune and Bapu Trembakji Savant. These leaders uh, will uh, lead this particular revolt of the Ramushis. Okay. Umaji Naik will later be uh, captured and he will be hanged. Result, British forces once again were able to restore order but they tried to reconcile a bit and recruited the Ramushis into the hill police. Ramushis were recruited into the hill police. So this is about Ramushi uprising in Maharashtra. Then comes the Kohli uprising. Kohli uprising. The Kohli community is again located in Maharashtra, parts of Gujarat and also there are some in Andhra Pradesh. They will rebel against the Britishers. Reasons are the same basically. The same type of reasons. The changes that the Britishers had brought about. The annexations that had been done in this area that altered the traditional way of life leading to disruption leading to these revolts the britishers had also additionally 
dismantled the forests of this area during their operations and that had uh, you know affected the livelihood of this people ultimately the britishers will suppress so kohli community revolt very brief information you need to remember in this manner 1829 1839 and 1844 to 48 in these years we will see the insurrection of kohli's after this comes the munda rebellion munda rebellion or what is referred to as ulgulan revolt ulgulan background mundas again a tribe in eastern part of india they responded to the agrarian breakdown and cultural interference that britishers were doing birsa munda is the leader of this particular revolt who is uh, to this state revered for the role that he had played in this fight region once again in chota nagpur region basically modern day jharkhand area causes of this revolt were erosion of the khund katti system basically a system in which the tribals through lineage collectively owned the forest land there was no concept of individual ownership as such but the britishers they brought in the concepts of individual ownership and that led to a big disruption exploitation by zamindars and money lenders who have been introduced into this area they are introduced into this area because the britishers want to exploit the resources so zamindars are there to maximize the revenue many thekedars will also be sent these thekedars will get contract for exploiting forest related resources money lenders will come in to give loans to the peasants to pay their revenue to the state all of these will be like acting like leeches on the uh, tribal peasants and you know other hunter gatherers they also made the peasants to they also made these tribals to do forced labor for them if you were not able to pay your loan back then in that case till the loan was paid you had to do forced labor this was naturally humiliating and also economically debilitating cultural interference was also starting during this period of colonial rule christian missionary activity was going on over here and this naturally hurted the sentiments of the tribals birsa munda he responds to this situation he urges his community to reform to give up various vices like drinking intoxicating drinks give up on various different types of superstitions and rather tries to make them uh, you know better human beings now traditionally the tribals had lived in that same way but over the years some of the vices had crept in superstitions had increased so birsa munda he tries to fight back against them he wanted to revive the traditional way of life of the tribals now he realizes in this process that a larger systemic problem is the presence of colonial rule as long as this exploitative nature of the state will be there it is impossible to go back to the earlier pristine times so this movement which starts with a social uh, you know tenor ultimately will become a political movement where the tribals they will fight against the britishers and their agents result birsa munda was captured and later imprisoned he will die in the captivity but the britishers were although successful in suppressing the revolt in this revolt also they will take some positive steps chota nagpur tenancy act in 1908 was brought about chota nagpur tenancy act and accordingly sale of land to non tribals was prohibited and the traditional khund katti system was also recognized by the britishers in this area so this is munda ulgulan of 19 1899 1900 this is a significant tribal revolt guys and that is why upsc had asked this question also with reference to the history of india ulgulan or the great tumult is the description of which of the following a b c d answer of course as you know is birsa munda's revolt of 1899 to 1900 now after this we will see a couple of uprisings in northeastern part of india where also we find a lot of different tribes khasi uprising in that is famous khasis a tribe in assam back then 
of course now modern day meghalaya they revolted against east india company's plan to secure a road through their territory this road was to connect the plain areas of bengal with the river valley in assam so passing through the forest area remember this is the time when britishers have try signed the treaty of yandabu with the burmese 1826 and they have compelled the burmese to you know give up their claims on assam ahoms earlier were ruling there the burmese had taken over that area from ahoms to start with the britishers enter into that first anglo burmese war for multiple reasons defeat it and in the context of northeast they force the burmese to give up claim on assam and then themselves arrest that area and now they want to build a road that will connect uh, you know uh, assam's brahmaputra valley right up to the plains of eastern bengal because that is the closest area for them in terms of british india so that will bring british east india company into conflict with the khasi tribe because the khasi area uh, that road is going to pass through the khasi area basically okay so assam's mountainous territory jaintia garo khasi these hills this is where this action is taking place reason is forced labor that was being used for making of this road and also the influx of outsiders again the thekedars and all different types of elements of the british state either direct or their agents who are entering into this area this is being uh, you know hated by the tribes in those areas prominent leader remember the name of tirath singh tirath singh name is important british military suppress this revolt by using bigger power and also imposed economic embargo and gave you know very harsh punishment to the khasi villages in these areas who had rebelled against the construction of this road for britishers see they have got a big land in assam after defeating burma they want to exploit the resources of assam but to do that profitably they need connectivity with bengal and this road was going to be their arterial road for exploiting the massive resources of assam that is the broader geo strategic significance of that particular route the khasis rebel and fight against it so the britishers also come down with their full might one last revolt over here is that of singpos the context is again the same you remember the period is the same the context of assam being taken over uh, after defeating the burmese causes opposition to british occupation remember the name chief nirang fidu the reason was because of british occupation of this area after that war the britishers had given a impression that they are not going to occupy assam but then after defeating burmese they did occupy assam and this led to a lot of discontent amongst the tribes over there ultimately britishers managed to suppress this particular revolt lastly what were the weaknesses of these different uprisings we have seen all the types of traditional responses guys right we have seen the civil rebellions we have seen the peasant unrest we have now seen the tribal revolts also by no means these are all the revolts that took place there were many revolts but then we have seen those on which questions have been asked or can be asked okay these traditional revolts ultimately ended in failure because of many internal weaknesses we have discussed these points but a quick overview of them once again the revolts were largely localized they are spread is limited to one or a few adjoining districts only it does not go beyond that so consequently britishers are able to easily isolate march their armies and suppress those revolts so localized nature second based on local grievances only unlike in the modern response where we will see congress will try to build a broad based opposition to british rule here the revolts are based on very specific local grievances only thirdly semi feudal characteristic the leadership of all of these revolts is not with a new intelligentsia it is with traditional type of leaders only people who are uh, you can say vestiges of the old feudal order those same type of people will lead the revolt 
then pacified easily by using force and some conciliation the britishers were able to pacify these revolts within a matter of weeks and months they did not perpetually continue lastly the methods that were used in the absence of modern politicization methods based on violence traditional weapons old type of ideas and systems those were at the core of these revolts and therefore the modern britishers were able to overcome them rather easily so these were the weaknesses or limitations now let us see a couple of questions that have been asked before by upsc and are connected to the areas that we have discussed in the last two lectures this is asked in 2011 which among the following provided a common factor for tribal insurrection in the 19th century common factor for tribal insurrection introduction of new system of land revenue and taxation of tribal products influence of foreign religious missionaries rise of a large number of money lenders traders and revenue farmers as middlemen the complete disruption of old agrarian order of the tribal community which amongst the following provided a common factor for tribal insurrection okay. now while all of these factors are certainly relevant in their own ways but the underlying larger theme is that disruption which we have been talking about constantly that disruption of the old order of the tribal communities all of this is manifestation the essence is that disruption so that is the answer answer option d next question which of the following statements correctly explains the impact of industrial revolution on india during first half of 19th century first half of 19th century indian handicrafts were wind machines were introduced in indian textile in large numbers railway lines were laid in many parts heavy duties were imposed on the imports of british manufacturers it's an easy question see machines were introduced in indian textile industry this was not the case in fact first industry comes up in 1853 first factory so this is talking about first half of 19th century so before this so this is out of question railway lines were laid out this also starts 1853 for the first time so this is also out of question heavy duties on imports of british manufacturers will they do this obviously they will not tax their own products they will rather want them to sell very well here in india indian products when they go to britain they will be levied with a custom duty of 200 to 400 percent whereas british goods from 2 to 8 percent in that range so obviously this is also not the case answer is answer option a okay so these were some of the questions guys that were asked in this area i hope you found today's session useful in our next class we are going to discuss the biggest of all traditional response or revolt that we saw in india which is revolt of 1857 the revolt of 1857 has all the characteristics of traditional response it's just that its scale is very massive and consequently its significance is very high and therefore we are going to dedicate the next lecture to revolt of 1857 don't miss that at any cost if you've liked this lecture then please do smash that like button share some love in the comment box and also pass on this video to your other friends i'll see you in my next class Thank you.